right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ryan Brocher with Matchstick Ventures. Um, excited to be here for this workshop uh, around seven principles for startup success. Um, I, I think everything's going well here. Uh, if, if you have any questions or anything pops up, um, please just let me know in the chat. Um, on the side here, it looks like someone was asking about uh, loading this. So I think we are good to go. Um, I'm going to be sharing a, a presentation here as I go through this. Um, and uh, there's going to be plenty of room for Q&A at the end. So it, it, I can, <laughs> I've done this presentation as quickly as uh, 15, 20 minutes uh, if, if I uh, had a really short amount of time. So we got about 45. Um, I'm guessing we'll, we'll do about 30 minutes um, uh, of the presentation and then we'll get straight into Q&A. So for the Q&A, we can either do it in the chat uh, here or if you want to request to come on camera and ask questions that way. Um, we can do it um, either way. But like I said, we should have plenty of uh, time at the end for questions on this or just yeah, anything in general that I that I could be helpful with. So um, so without further ado, I'll get my presentation up here and uh, we'll get rolling. One sec. Great. Um, so I think we should have everything on here for the presentation. Um, once again, if you have any questions, you know, let me know as we go. I can only see one side of this at a time here. So um, I'll be kind of going back and forth between, between the slides, but I think we um, should be ready to roll. Cool. So uh, once again, this is the, the seven principles for startup success workshop. Uh, I'm Ryan Brocher. I'm the, the founder and partner of Matchstick Ventures here in the Twin Cities. Um, also the former managing director of the Techstars retail program with Target and um, actually the co-founder of Twin Cities Startup Week. So I remember back in uh, 2014 um, when, we, when we started this, um, it, it's, it's come a long ways. I mean, we had maybe a few hundred attendees and, you know, 15, 20 events. And now, you know, thousands of attendees and hundreds of events. It's, it's just absolutely incredible. So um, I'm also the co-founder of Beta, uh, who puts this on. Um, I'm uh, chairman of the board of, of Beta as well, so continue to be very active uh, with the organization that I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, and prior to this, I was a, a former startup founder, so I had multiple startups um, that we grew and sold uh, over the years. But I'm based here in the Twin Cities, uh, live in St. Paul, work kind of all across uh, the metro here. Um, and prior to COVID, spent a lot of time kind of traveling to other markets and, and uh, uh, making networks there too. But for now, uh, primarily in my basement, like all of us. Um, so at Matchstick, uh, just a quick overview of, of what we do and, and what we strive for, uh, and then we'll dig into the workshop here. So our vision at Matchstick is to help founders succeed in underserved startup ecosystems through capital and connections. Um, I have a partner at Matchstick, Natty Zola, who's based in Boulder, Colorado. Um, and I'm based here in the Twin Cities. And so we focus, um, we have a geographic focus and that we look kind of across the Rockies, across the North uh, with bases in Boulder and Minneapolis. Uh, and then also across the, the Techstars network. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm a former managing director for the Techstars Retail Program, I'm super involved with the local Farm to Fork Program and Healthcare Program. Uh, I'm also a venture partner for the Techstars Investment Team, so working with kind of Techstars programs all across the country. Um, so, um, you know, we're, we're supportive there as well, and we'll make investments um, in those markets. Um, you know, some of the numbers on Matchstick, we're in our second fund. It's a $30 million fund. Um, we invest somewhere between 250K to 750K uh, into pre-seed and seed rounds. Uh, we'll be lead investors. Um, across these two funds, we've made over 50 investments uh, and a lot of uh, money is, is definitely rolling into the Minnesota market. Um, some of the notable Minnesota um, companies are below here, including Branch, Upsea, Inspectorio, um, Structural, et cetera. Um, so we're, we're big, big uh, supporters of this market um, and, uh, you know, we'll continue to, to write uh, any checks 
uh, into into companies uh, based here. So very very exciting. Um, so that's that's Matchstick. Uh, happy to talk about any of that at the end here too. Um, I just want to do one quick check to make sure there's any questions over here. It seems like everything is is going well, and you'll see the the mul multiple windows uh, going into the abyss there. Um, so back to the presentation here. Um, so the the all the content in this is really based around um, that between Natty and I at Matchstick, uh, we've worked with hundreds of founders uh, either via investing in them via Matchstick um, across the uh, many uh, tech stars programs that we've run. Um, and, you know, we found some things that many startups fail to do some of the simple things that that can really add up to immense value. Um, and that should should not be overlooked. So we're just going to cover some of our favorite hacks today that a team can do or not do. Um, and hopefully you can leave with, uh, you know, some actionable items um, to take away from you uh, for you and your startup. So uh, this is the, the seven principles for startup success. So let's get things rolling. So number one, uh, I think a lot of startups focus on the what we need to get done list. Um, uh, one thing that we found is a is to create a don't do list. So instead of a to do list, do the the don't do list. Um, because the startup's main advantage against really any of the incubates um, and even some of their competitors at the same stage is that they can have a intense focus and can act very quickly with speed. But you know, most make the mistake of trying to do too much and ultimately do a lot of unnecessary work. Um, and really time is a currency that the startups have and they need to spend wisely. Um, so it's, it's also important to focus on what you should be doing, but it's also a good reminder to focus on what you should not be doing. Um, so that you can gain focus, increase the speed by freeing up your time and headspace to get the most important work done. So focus is the number one killer um, of startups when it comes to how they operate their business in focus. So it's good to know what you should be focusing on, but also what you shouldn't be. So, you know, three ways to do that is um, at the end of each week, do a retrospective to determine what activities actually contributed the most value um, and cut those out that, that don't and add it to your don't do list, right? And a lot of stuff that ends up on this list is is probably the usual stuff you you may end up spending a lot of time on, right? Like probably like responding to to worthless emails, um, you know, focusing on swag orders for the company, uh, <laughs> you know, all that stuff where it's like taking you away from the like actual progress um, that is really important for your startup to to have. Um, so write out your to do list in rank order as well. Um, but then cross off everything but the top three and focus on those top three, right? Like those, if you stack rank them, all your time and attention should be on those top three things until they're done. Um, and if you do that every day, you're always going to have a list of a hundred things to do. But if you could just, you know, cross off those top three um, uh, on your list every day, um, you will make some uh, incredible progress um, in, in your company. So, and then uh, there's always this like maybe someday thing that is like an idea, like something that needs to get done, but doesn't need to get done right now or is not strategically important to, you know, today, this this week, this quarter. Um, but, you know, it's good to, to keep a list of those things because every once in a while you can bring those into the important uh, to-do list. Um, and they, these may be, you know, kind of bigger projects, maybe tangential um, ideas for your for your product, um, maybe ideas to help with the team, uh, et cetera. But there's always this like column of things that should be um, kept and written down so that you don't forget it, but also not something that you're going to stress over if it doesn't get done until it gets put in those top three things. So uh, create a, a don't do list, but I think this really forces you to focus on what you should be doing list. So that's number one. Um, Number two, so make progress on your uh, P1 OKR every single day. So at Techstars and across the Matchstick portfolio, we are big fans of, of OKRs um, and uh, you know, it's objective key results. So really laying out goals for your, your company and your teams that are on a daily basis, weekly basis, quarterly basis, annual basis, and they kind of all roll up into that. Um, and you need to know what your top OKR is every single day and communicate that out to your 
to your employees and your team. Uh, this helps you create a disciplined culture that prioritizes the most important work every single day and everyone knows what needs to get done um, no matter what that day. So the, the, and the reason is, is startups can be pushed in, in many directions and there's so many shiny objects to, to chase on a daily basis, fires to put out that it's, it's easily be distracted. But in order to maintain that speed and focus that we talked about on, on the previous slide, it's critical to get the most important stuff done and communicate what that is and make sure that the team is aligned to, to go out and do that. So, um, you know, three ways, uh, steps to making that happen is just make sure everyone in the organization has an OKR. They know what the team's OKR is, but they also know what their individual OKRs are and how they relate to, to the main one. And agree as a team that no one will finish their day without doing at least one thing or making some progress on their OKR. It's not a day, there's never a day that goes by that there isn't time dedicated to advancing um, towards that, that OKR. And then at the, you know, publish the, the weekly OKRs for everyone in the org. So everyone knows what each other thinks the priority is and is open to challenges. So if you think your personal OKR is this, like that needs to be stated in the open and it needs to be challenged by the team to make sure that, that they agree that that goes towards, you know, the, the goals of, of the organization. Um, accountability is is huge when it comes to um, OKRs and, and holding people responsible um, for what they said they would do and how that rolls up to progress for the organization. All right, moving along. Number three, um, identify and track one North Star metric so that you are all aligned on what is the most important because what you measure is what you manage. Um, there's... There's um, a lot of things you can measure. There's a lot of things you can manage. What's really hard is to know if if you're measuring uh, something that you're managing that actually matters. <laughs> so startups need to know if they're headed in the right direction and focused on the same thing. So here again, kind of similar to the first two points is what is the actual metric? Like what is, is there some numbers that you're tracking? Is it, is it um, you know, some sort of project that you're working towards? Everyone needs to know what that is and then also know how you're going to measure that because what gets measured gets gets um, accomplished. Um, so really, you know, three strategies for that. Boil the business and stage that you're on to one metric that rules them all. And it should be posted all around the office so people know how, how the team is doing, how you're progressing towards um, that goal and the metric that really matters to drive those numbers up. And it's it's tracked as a group, and you know change the metric as as the business grows. Um, it, that's one metric for this quarter or this week may not be the same metric that you track the following week uh, based on on strategies. But everyone needs to know what that metric is, communicated, and they should all be rallying uh, around trying to you know improve uh, and make progress on that metric. Um, as you go around and ask everybody what you know how their OKRs um, are for the week. Um, we should be always asked then how does that relate to the North Star metric? Like what is the, the that OKR that you are going to pursue? How is that going to move the needle um, on that North Star metric? And it's another way to kind of challenge that everyone's moving in the right direction. Um, and lastly, we see a lot of these North Star metrics, um, They it's really hard to get these right. And anyone who's been on, in a Techstars program with me knows that I, I, I hammer this in, is that it's really easy to throw out there a metric that is binary. It's, it's like accomplish this, do this or not do this. Um, did it get done? Did it not get done? Like these are, are really, um, I think they're lazy, lazy metrics to, to focus on. Yes, there is a thing to be done, but how do you know if you're moving towards that progress? So think of it as a, as a, a flow number versus a, a stock number. So uh, something that maybe is like we're 50% of the way there or things are increasing by a certain amount of of, of users per week or, or uh, you know, revenue per week versus, uh, you know, total revenue for the week. Um, that way you kind of know as you get through the week, how you're, how you're flowing um, towards that. So um, hard to kind of get it right. It takes some iterations, takes some challenging, but once you have it right, it's incredibly powerful. Cool. I'm just going to check one more time here on the, Looks like we're good to go. Um, get to some of these questions there. Um, so on to number four. So 
as a startup, it's incredibly important to stay close to your customers um, at the very early stage. You know, a lot of times when when Matchtech makes an investment or you know we work with a company via TechStars, these are very early stage companies who are still many times building their product, um, and they need to have the the customer sitting at the table with them at all times, either figuratively or literally. Uh, it's easier to do in COVID now. You can. You have them on on the call, um, but you know you want them to be there, and you need to be tracking the number of customer conversations you're having in a week, um, because startups can easily become internally focused and two heads down, building a product, projecting on their customers what they think they want or what they would want, um, and it, it limits their your your empathy for for the customer and the ability to to more deeply understand their problem. So they like every decision that is made on the product on vision you should have the uh, either have customers that you're literally talking to and asking about it and or have the mindset of it and be tracking the number of customer conversations you're having a week so that you make sure that you're you're never too far away from from your customer their their voice is incorporated to all your work uh, so that when you do crank on something, you're cranking on something that you know that they're going to want or that they've requested um, versus something that you think they would want. So um, what's nice about this, this is, a, this is a KPI that literally every startup can track. It, it's, it's one of the only universal KPIs you can, can really think of. Um, you know, oh, every, every, every company is going to have a customer and you should be having tracking the number of conversations you're having with them. Um, and this shouldn't be like an intern who's calling the customer, uh, and, you know, and taking notes. This should be the founders of the company. This should be the the C level uh, most important people in the organization uh, having these these regular conversation, not support sales interns, etc. It's really important to always um, the, the the top people at the organization having these conversations so that they have the voice of the of the customer in their mind. And there's really not a, a right number to have here, but this is more of like a, did we do this this week? And, you know, ideally it's, it's increasing. Um, you know, maybe there's some sort of weekly goal of like 10 cost customer conversations, five, one, whatever it is, but it's just designed to give you the awareness of how much or how little it, the voice is incorporated into your business. Um, and we can't stress enough, uh, how important that is. Um, especially at, at the early stages for startups. All right, moving on, number five. Um, you know, emphasize the truth over who is right. So this is much more of like how you are as a leader, how you work as an organization, um, because startups lose valuable time and resources when they start to get their egos involved to say, if, if you have a culture of like, you were wrong, I was right, versus the, what's well, the truth, what happened, let's move on. The only things that matter are really to find those truths for your customers in your market. So, you know, the blame game never really makes progress, but finding out the truth, using the data to make decisions, and then basing the decisions off of that um, is, is a much more uh, progressive way to, to make decisions and, and uh, show progress in your organizations. So that you can, this also leads to, to creating hypotheses for the organizations that get challenged before the decisions are made. Um, so that, that you know, the business can move faster, you can build a, a, a culture based on data and evidence as a foundation versus the, I'm smarter than you, I have more experience than you um, thing where that's really top down and, and not, um, you know, not really helpful for the organization as a whole. Um, and it can, can breed a, a negative culture. Um, and, and culture is really important as you'll see in our next couple slides here. So. So redefine, um, yeah, ways to do that is, is to redefine mistakes into learning opportunities where the only real mistakes here are times you didn't learn about something important about your market um, or your customer prior to making a decision. Um, yes, mistakes will be made. There's so many, so many mistakes will be made. Um, but the what not, not matter here is that, you know, that the mistake was made is more of what you learn from it and where can you go from it? So do some root cause analysis using the five whys method while avoiding ever doing the five who's. So if you get into a, a, a retrospective of like, hey, a mistake was made, um, you know, ask the question why that mistake was made and then why why that happened and then why that happened. You get you can get to the five root cause, that the actual root cause of, of what happened here. 
um, versus the, hey, it was your, you know, you said it and then the blame game starts to go down the, the trail to, to whoever the root is. It's, it's just not productive as a whole. Um, and then run a, a monthly confront the brutal facts meeting where all the issues in the market product company are freely brought up and discussed. And you'll be surprised of the insights that, you know, your team, uh, maybe they've read articles, maybe they've talked to customers, uh, maybe they've, you know, had some insights on the market, but, you know, you need to like confront the brutal facts of like how the business is doing, how it's reacting to the market, where bad decisions were made, where great decisions were made. Um, and, and hopefully the whole team can come along and, and continue to make some, some great decisions uh, in the future. All right. Um, moving on to number six, um, send consistent updates to supporters. Um, startups need help solving problems, right? Like I, I don't think anyone starts a startup knowing all the answers. And uh, actually I, I'll say that nobody starts a startup knowing all the answers. You may have some insights, but there's so many problems to solve. There's so many connections need to be made. There's so many resources you need access to. Um, and, and you need help, right? Like you need help getting through uh, all phases of a, of a startup and you need to be open to receiving that help. Um, but you need to be at the top of mind of your supporters and they need to know where you need help. Um, so communication and sending regular consistent updates is the number one ROI action you can take uh, for an organization to get leverage and exponential benefits um, from your network and from people who want to help you succeed. Um, what you wanna do is you wanna have a tribe or a network of people following you in your journey, ready to help when you need it and being your number one cheerleaders. You think about the people who are supportive, more likely than not, they, they, they want you to succeed, right? Like they wanna help mentor, they wanna make connections for you. But if they don't know what you need help with, uh, or are not being, you know, poked to say, hey, here's here's you know some great stuff we've been doing, and oh, by the way, we need this help. You know, out of touch, out of mind for for a lot of them. They need they need to have that kind of consistent um, communication. And and um, you know, anyone who's who's worked with me knows that I'm a I'm a big fan of of regular email updates or um, uh, even you know weekly updates when it's when it's crunch time. Um, you know, every other week updates when things start to to get into more of a groove and then, you know, you can get into to monthly updates um, even at uh, once you, um, you know, start to really figure it out and, and have more of that help internal. But communication is, is so, so important. Um, transparent communication too, of, of saying what is going well, what is, what is not going well. So, uh, you know, three things to, to think through on that is consistency is incredibly important. Um, it needs to be at least once a month might even be more depending on um, you know what phase of the company you're going on. Um, you got to lead with a compelling subject line and make it easily skimmable for the audience. So, I mean, odds are they're not going to read word for word everything, but put that stuff right at the top that you need help with. Um, and I think you know that's more likely to get engagement. Um, you know, be open, candid, and direct. Uh, I think being humble and vulnerable goes a long ways in help having people help you um, and, and reach out to, to uh, make connections for you. So that, that uh, authenticity vulnerability leads to a connection with Z, which can lead to, to value creation of unlocking, you know, another network of, of help for you. Um, and, uh, you know, here's just like a simple order of what you can do in your updates that we've seen work really well. So, um, you know, make sure to have a kind of a reminder of what your company does. Uh, if there's an email update, get that ask right away, right? Like this is the thing for you that as a founder is the biggest ROI is, is putting that ask there. So put it right at the beginning and then get into the regular KPIs that you're being tracking consistently. So people kind of know what is important to you. Um, you know, highlight some of the accomplishments that you've had over the, the, the last period, make sure to highlight some of the failures and learnings that you've had, um, you know, per our, our previous slide, um, do some shout outs and, and gratitudes uh, for the company, for people who've already helped you so that you know, the other people know that there's a lot of engaged uh, people in your, in your tribe. Um, and uh, it's, it's always fun to have some sort of surprise uh, at the bottom, either some sort of personal connection uh, for folks who get to the, the end of the email. Um, it's pretty funny if you put some Easter eggs in there, 
uh, the responses you'll get for the folks. And, and it could gauge to know if people are actually reading it to the end as well. Um, all right, and uh, you know, last but certainly not least, um, number seven. So create a reflective culture from day one. Um, and this is a big learning we've had actually from one of our founders, Liz Giorgi from um, Suna. And you know, startups tend to create a monocultures by hiring people in their network who look like themselves and have similar life experiences, right? Like you, you want to. There's a tendency to hire um, your friends, right? Are, are people that that you can relate to uh, immediately? But all the data shows that diverse teams overperform. So think about that as you go into hiring, as you start to build out your team. Um, that you create a, a reflective culture from day one so that you can incorporate diversity into your company from its foundation. It's incredibly difficult to catch up. If your first 10 hires uh, look, act, and sound like you, uh, it's going to be really hard to convince employee number 11 or 12 who you know maybe think different than you, look different than you, come from different networks than you to agree to join um, join the, the the company, even if it's a it's a, an essential hire. So, um, you know, three ways to go about uh, changing this for you and your org uh, from the beginning is really gather data on the population around your company location. And instead of having the company reflect the founders um, and have it, you know, look and act like the founders, have it reflect the diversity of the, the communities and the locations that you are going to be uh, hiring from, right? And that's really important. So people feel a sense of community um, from from where they are. So uh, think about that as you uh, think about like what is diversity um, in your company and have it be reflective more of the locations of where your company is from versus the, you know, just strictly the reflection of, of the founders. Um, for every hire that you do, commit to having um, at least two finalists for each open position, and for one of those to come from an underrepresented group that you know is is different than than the founders themselves. Um, that always kind of puts a lens on um, uh, on the candidate. On is this reflective of of the company or is it of of the is this the culture we want to have? And um, and it's it's a great way to kind of force yourself to to have that conversation for every single hire. Um, and then invest time in, in bias training and other DEI tools. Like I think it's it's important from the beginning to stress if this is a, um, a priority for for you and your company to show that you're investing in that and that it's a priority um, uh, from the very beginning. And I think having this culture um, of diversity um, leads to better teams, leads to better performance, and ultimately leads to greater outcomes. Um, for the startups and and um, yeah is is a is a big uh, important thing that we look at uh, with with Matchstick as well. So um, just to to recap here, um, the seven things um, I'll, I'll just read these quickly. But you know, number one, create a don't do list. Um, number two, make progress on your P1 OKR every single day. Uh, number three, identify and track. Uh, your one North Star metric communicated out uh, to everybody. Um, stay close to your customers. Number four, track the number of customer conversations every week. Um, number five, emphasize the truth over who is right within your company. Uh, number six, uh, send consistent updates to supporters. And number seven is to create a reflective culture uh, from day one. Um, so this is not everything. It clearly is, we could have made a list of about uh, of 100 things uh, for startups. Um, but you know, as we started to stack rake, um, what we think is the biggest ROI um, for for early stage startup founders. Um, these were the seven things that um, we think that if you follow these, you'll see some um, dramatic results uh, in, in progress within your um, within your startup. So. That's the seven things, um, and uh, I'd like to open it up now to some Q and A. Um, as I mentioned before, we can you feel free to you know throw the questions um, into the chat if that's easy for you, um, or we can um, I can bring you on and you can ask a question live uh, as well. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen here, and we'll just go straight um, back to hop in. So let's see here. I'll get caught up on some of these questions here. Um, let's see here. 
So, you know, there's a question here, it looks like uh, on what is a North Star metric. Um, I mean, I, I think I touched on this a little bit in in the in the workshop, but yeah, you know, it's it's the one metric that is the most important thing to to move as an organization today. So, you know, for later stage startups, I mean, for let's see, like public companies, it may be stock price, right? It may be their their stock price today. They want it to improve, right? And that's that's a kind of a generic, like clearly if you're creating value or whatever, like that number will go up and, and value is being created. For an early stage startup, it's 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 rarely that, right? Like it's it might be like if you're pre-product, the North Star metric may be, you know, how many um, how many customer interviews you've done, you know, this week, and maybe that's like a hundred, you know, and you want to progress to get to one hundred as a team. Um, if you're in market, it, it may be, you know, number of new downloads you know, per week, right? And you want to, or, or how the growth rate of downloads, you want to show momentum from there. And that's kind of more of a flow metric. So it, it can be really broad, but it's it's the number one thing that is should be on the top of everyone's mind um, in the organization when they're starting to think through what they should be doing at every moment, right? Like, is, is this being, is this going to progress the, the metric and it, or the stuff that I'm tracking, is that going to actually move that North Star metric um, forward? So just think of it as like the, the, the main goal, the main main number that matters uh, at that point in time. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Well, there was, someone was asking around KPI. Um, it's a key performance indicator. So think through like, there again, this this can be a metric, right? This can be like one of the North Star metrics can be a KPI that you're tracking against. Um, but yeah, it's, it's something that can be measured. Um, it can be tracked and it can be approved upon um, from the actions of the company. So I could do a whole workshop just on KPIs and I, I do regularly <laughs> uh, around this, but um, just know that it's 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 basically a, a goal setting um, uh, format that uh, helps align the organization towards towards progress. Um, let's see, any other question? All right, so Jay, question. Uh, I love this one. So, what's the most important pre revenue first priority? Um, give some examples there. I think pre-revenue, um, let's say even pre-product, the number one thing is around uh, customers and customer interviews. Um, I, I, you could make a case for a lot of things here, but ultimately if you're pre-revenue and pre-product, you're working towards becoming a post-revenue, post-product company. Um, and you don't have either of those things if you don't have a, a customer. Uh, at some point, right? Like, and so you should be building towards that. Um, and so a lot of times, like in, in let's say within the magic portfolio or tech stars, if a company is pre-product, you know, it's not, it's not downloads, it's not revenue, it's not, it's not uh, new features and it's not that. It's a lot of times it's how many interviews did we do? And then how, how do we incorporate that in to the product, into our, our strategy, right? Like our go-to-market strategy, our, revenue strategy, our pricing strategy, like there's so much to be deemed from that. So, you know, eventually the, you need to do something with those customer interviews and there may be some, some uh, metrics to track kind of post uh, product, post revenue. Clearly that's, it's a little bit easier then, but uh, more times than not pre-revenue is a uh, customer interactions, customer interviews, um, customer demos, like if you start to get a product, like how that goes and be tracking that as, as much as you can. Great question though. I think um, it's, it's harder to do KPIs when you don't have as much quantitative things. It's very qualitative <laughs> at the beginning. So how do you turn that qualitative stuff that you're doing uh, into quantitative measurable things? Um, it's tricky. It's really tricky. Um, so Michael had a question um, around a lot of our stuff speaks to startup culture and behavior rather than attention specifically to the solution or product itself. Can you say more about that as a priority? Well, 
Yeah, I would absolutely. I think you can tell our bias um, with Matchstick is is to be founder focused, to be customer focused, um, and and creating a culture that thrives. And I think culture is really a, a catalyst that I think many founders overlook. Uh, setting a very strong culture um, early on um, is 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 super powerful in in helping hire. Uh, people because they know immediately kind of, you know, how you operate, how the company operates, and they can determine if they want to be a part of that or not. Um, it, ha- it helps you with partnerships um, and potential customers. They kind of know how you operate. There's a culture around maybe it's execution or accountability or diversity, like whatever they, and they can identify with that um, or not. Um, and, um, you know, I think the the stuff that we presented today is kind of generic across all startups. Um, and the, the product itself is, is very case by case, right? Like, I think there's a lot you could say about, um, you know, strategies for improving product and and there's a lot of, you know, very demonstrated ways around product development where this is much more around, um, startup development, you know, thinking early stage, how do you set the company up for success into whatever vertical, whatever platform, whatever, you know tech stack you want to get into. Um, these are kind of more universal uh, for that of, of ways that you can very, all startups can can relate to. So um, yeah, it, it is a priority. I mean, you think about very early stage, you got you want to get some of that stuff right because it scales, right? Like it, it can scale into huge organizations. Um, you know, culture can scale, KPIs can scale, um, all that stuff scales really well. And it's really important to get that in early um, along with your kind of product and solution um, uh, goals that you have at an early stage. Um, so yeah, it looks like Ryan, you just kind of a comment here um, for founders to, to get the interviews done. Um, I've seen people who literally just have a, on their calendar uh, recurring like our maybe two hours of throughout the week where they just do customer calls, right? And 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 either that can be existing customers or that can be potential customers. Uh, it's probably gonna be potential customers first, and then it's gonna go to, let's hope, uh, actual customers that you have a, you know, a long list of folks you can, you can work through. Um, I've also seen founders um, do customer support early on um, where they, they're the person who actually answers the phone call when someone calls in and has a problem. There's a lot to be learned uh, early on if people are calling you with their problems with your product or with your service or with your company. Um, you know, that is a bit more disruptive because you don't always know when that call is going to come on. But, you know, I think early stage, a lot of uh, teams basically just kind of rotate around who who answers the call for the, the customer support. And the founders should absolutely be uh, one of those people who uh, is is willing to to pick up the phone when when people call or you know answer the emails etc. But more times than not, you're going to get some sort of you know question from an email or like within the app or within the thing. If you can then respond with a phone call, you're going to get a lot more insights or you know some sort of video call uh, than just um, you know email back and forth. So stuff. Um, let's see. Yeah, so there's a recommendation around running lean for customer interview templates. That's great. Um, cool. Well, it looks like uh, if anyone else has any questions, I can I can hang out here for a couple more minutes. We've got about five more minutes. Um, but uh, you know, my email is Ryan at matchstickventures.com. Um, and I'm happy to follow up with anybody if you have any questions on this. Um, later today I'm gonna be on the, the main stage uh, talking about fundraising with COVID. Um, I've also got uh, another work, a uh, couple workshops uh, coming up uh, in, the, in the subsequent weeks. So I hope everyone can join for that. But uh, yeah, once again, it's just Ryan at matchstickventures.com. Uh, on Twitter, I'm at our brochure, R-B-R-O-S-H-A-R. Uh, and our website is uh, matchstickventures.com. So um, with that, I think we'll we'll sign off. Um, and uh, you know, just want to thank everybody for for joining, um, this is such a uh, great 
an honor to be here and to talk to everyone and to, to be a part of, of Twin Cities Startup Week. So uh, enjoy your weeks uh, and uh, hopefully you guys can, can join me for uh, more workshops the rest of this week. Thanks.